Welcome to another segment of Northeast Spectrum. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host tonight. And tonight we've got a special one tonight. Uh, maybe some, some would say that maybe we'll be a little sad. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, after just talking with my guests just, just prior, to, prior to the show, I, I find we're going we're gonna to have within our midst uh, the pioneer who, who brought us many, many positives within our community uh, to, that made it a better place for young folks to, uh, to survive, to live, uh, to be educated. Uh, I mean, just many things. I just can't go beyond that particular point without saying that, hey, uh, Matt Prophet, we're going to have Matt Prophet. Matt Prophet is on now with me. He's here. Uh, a guy who's been around for 10 years in this educational system of ours. He's brought many, many positives to our community. He's, he's pioneered uh, some ideas, some creativities, uh, as far as youth are concerned, all youth across the board. And so what tonight, what we're going to do, we're going to give him the opportunity to kind of go back in history and time and, and talk about uh, the problems that he encountered when he first came here, taking over where Dr. Blanchard left off. Uh, for the, for the, so for the following 10 years, he's going to give us an insight as to the pluses, the minuses, and you know, as achievements, his ups and his downs, and, and then bring us up to date and just kind of give us a feel for our futures. And, and the impact of Measure 5. And, and I can remember that when we interviewed him, uh, uh, doing that, uh, those stressful times on Measure 5, and we were divided one side to the other. And it was said at that point in time that, that 5 would not have an impact on, on education. And, and Dr. Prophet was adamant about the fact that it would. And now today, we, here we are trying to figure out what do we do, and parents are upset. And it's kind of ironic that all of a sudden now the Oregonian is blaming him. <laughs> it's kind of interesting. But anyway, uh, we, we're going to have a, an interesting evening. We, we, uh, we're going to have a second hour, so we'd like for you to, if possible, reserve your calls at this point in time. We're going to take as much time as we can to get in this hour uh, some insight uh, on historical and, and bringing things up to future in education and giving us a feel about what's going to happen with, as far as the future of our young people in the Portland Public School. Dr. Prophet, welcome to Northeast Spectrum. Thank you, Bruce. Usual. Thank you very much. Matt, and I'm going to say Matt. Is that okay? I'm going to say Bruce. Okay. Okay, Bruce. <laughs> That's the deal. Hey, look, why don't we go back in time? Let's kind of give, uh, give the, the public again an opportunity uh, to kind of get a feel as to Matt's background and how he got to Portland, Oregon as superintendent of Portland Public School. Okay. Very briefly, Bruce, um, as many of our listening audience know, I served for 20 years in the military service. Okay. Uh, served in about eight or nine countries. Uh, did a lot of work in Europe for six years or so. Primarily as a nuclear weapons analyst and had great responsibilities with respect to attempting to fight the Russian bear for mm -hmm. in the Cold War. Mm -hmm. I was fortunate to fight in the Korean War. Did a lot of work there with uh, the United Nations, Ethiopian troops, Australians, Germans, British, and all others. In Vietnam, as a division tactical area advisor, and did a lot of work there with respect to um, the recruitment of Vietnamese troops, uh, also recruitment of Cambodians, uh, ran political elections in the Mekong Delta, was an advisor in Ohio for a long time, militarily, for the desegregation of the Ohio Guard. And I was the chief of individual training for the 5th United States Army in Chicago with responsibilities for some 14 different states in this country. Now, you were still active. I was active still duty. active duty, right. being assigned to right. those areas. And okay. I had the responsibility for preparing 150,000 men and women in the United States to fulfill worldwide uh, occupational needs in the military. And I think it was in that particular position where I really gained a burning desire to enter into education once I retired hmm. from the service. And upon concluding my terminal assignment uh, in Chicago in 1971, uh, at which time I was serving as the chief of individual training for Fifth Army, I decided to go into education. I had already been attending Northwestern and I went there and got a, um, a PhD from Northwestern in Evanston. But even after having gotten the, uh, the doctorate, I knew that there were very seriously many voids, many gaps, many lacks of actual experience 
in the field of education. So I was very, very fortunate to enter into what then existed as a premier five university consortium consisting of the City University of New York, Ohio State University, Northwestern University in Evanston, University of Texas in Austin, and Claremont Graduate School. And the purpose there was to test the efficacy of the belief that there did exist a high correlation between the managerial skills that are needed in all fields and those same skills being transferable, hopefully, into the field of education. Mm -hmm. So I got into this program. When I got into this program, the idea was for 10 of us who had been selected from around the country to bring to education some of the managerial experiences that we had had. I was in this program with people from the Ross Laboratories out of Columbus, Ohio. Other persons had headed the Presbyterian Church in New York State. We had individuals who had been Wall Street brokers. There were 10 or so of us mm -hmm. who came into the program. I spent about a year and a half, Bruce, uh, going through this program. And during that particular period of time, had the opportunity, subsequent to the completion of my doctorate, to do internships in some 17 different educational settings around the country. So my education beyond the academic went into the actual immersion model, really inserting myself into the actual ways in which education occurs or does not occur for that matter. Now that's working with students. I mean, working with students. I went and I did, uh, did an internship in Senator Mondale's office at the time. Mm -hmm. I did some internships in the Washington, D.C. school system, went to New York and did some work there uh, at City University of New York and did some uh, familiarity with the New York school system. I understudied Jim Redmond, superintendent of schools mm -hmm. in Chicago. Understudied Dick Foster in Berkeley as superintendent. I understudied Marcus Foster in Oakland as superintendent there. Went to a small country, Oklahoma, Mississippi town, my hometown, mm -hmm. and understudied the superintendent there. Mm -hmm. Rich suburbia, the Gold Coast of uh, Illinois. Rich systems, poor systems. Went through a lot of experiences. Mm -hmm. And coming out of that and having uh, gained what I felt was an actual opportunity to have immersed myself in the reality of life, I, I entered into education. One of the other experiences I had is I wanted to experience what it was like to be on various political agendas. In other words, at one time I uh, became very familiar with the tactics of the KKK mm. in terms of its uh, efforts to resegregate America. Mm -hmm. Became a staunch opponent of that. By the same token, uh, became very interested in the Solodinsky School in Chicago with respect to how is it that when people want to be militant or to be radical and to be revolutionary. How does that function? I was a part of that. Hmm. In fact, I remember having grown a big, big, we were all wearing afros at the time. Oh, I had the t-shirt on and we were doing so our demonstrations there. in San yeah. Francisco, beating on Mayor Aliotto's desk and the whole <laughs> bit. I had every experience. Imagine, mm -hmm. went to school with Nicaraguan kids in San Francisco, mm -hmm. went to schools with black kids in New York and the whole bit. You know, I immersed myself into that situation. So I ended up, Bruce, uh, being hired initially as a deputy superintendent in Lansing, Michigan. I was hired there in 1972. And the purpose of my being hired there was to act as the point person for the desegregation of the Lansing schools. I went to Lansing because at that time, in my view, Lansing, Michigan, and Pasadena, California were the only two systems in the United States who had actually sincerely taken unto themselves the task of bringing about true integration of public schools. Mm. I worked for a man by the name of Dr. I. Carl Candoli, and uh, we began implementing this desegregation plan there. Unfortunately, the, this desegregation plan was uh, reversed by the Board of Education, and uh, though the Board of Education turned from what had formerly existed when they hired me to an ultra-liberal board, it turned into a very radically oriented conservative board, hmm. which was really very heavily segregationist. But despite that, uh, we continued to work with the understanding of the Board of Education that we were going to fight to keep the school system integrated, though I was a deputy superintendent and Carl Candoli was a superintendent. Hmm. In fact, What's we, that definition of true integration? True integration is beyond the mixing of bodies. Okay. True integration is when you can go into any setting and you look at all the roles and the relationships in any kind of environment. And you cannot tell the difference of who's in that environment on the basis of ethnicity or race. Mm -hmm. You see people at all statuses, you'll be able to see youngsters in a classroom irrespective of their ethnicity, still just as inclined to be taking courses in foreign language or 
leaders of their classes, whatever mm -hmm. the case may be. Mm -hmm. That's integration. Desegregation is purely the mixing of bodies. Integration brings with it and has endemic, or at least uh, as an incipient part of its, of its definitional approach, the fact that the roles of all people are shared and shared equitably, mm -hmm. and, you, and there's parity across the board. So we were trying to present a system of true integration. We did a good job there in Lansing, and we'd made very, very good progress in Lansing. As a matter of fact, I served there for some six years as the executive deputy superintendent of the Lansing School District. Mm -hmm. And when Carl Candoli resigned from that position, the Board of Education, the night when they accepted uh, his resignation, said, um, Dr. Prophet, are you interested in being the superintendent? This is on the same <laughs> night. I said, yes. They said, we hereby offer you the superintendency. Will you accept it? I said, yes. The media had left, they didn't even though this was occurring. And I went into the, uh, the uh, superintendency in Lansing in January of 1978 on, a, on an eight to one vote of the Board of Education. I remained superintendent in Lansing for uh, four years or so, mm -hmm. during which period of time I continued the desegregation plan, implemented extensive site-based management, which you hear a lot about mm -hmm. now, mm -hmm. uh, in all of our schools, in addition to which we began to build a good, responsible fiscal base for operation of the Lansing schools. Uh, after leaving Lansing, but let me, before leaving Lansing, let me say this, is that one of the things I really tried to do there was to be on the cutting edge of converting the school system from what had been a smorgasbord of grades that were mixed. Some schools, for example, would have grades K through five, others would have grades four, five, six, seven, eight, others mm -hmm. would have grades eight through 12. Mm -hmm. I proposed and the Board of Education accepted the fact that we would convert to a middle school. So I went to England for a while, did a, a, quite a bit of studying there, did some teaching in England and so forth, because England was the first of the Western world to really convert to middle schools. And I also did a great deal of work there with the Department of Defense in terms of teaching classes uh, for Michigan State University in their extension program. So I stayed in Lansing as superintendent for four years, heard about an opening uh, for superintendency here in Portland. Mm -hmm. uh, as I sent for the information on Portland, I asked the person who was then the secretary for the Board of Education to send to me all of the articles which had been written on the Portland schools by the various media. And I was sent uh, articles, I think the journal was being published yeah, right, at the time. Right, yeah. I was sent one year's articles from the journal, mm -hmm. one year's articles from the Oregonian, one year's articles from the Observer, and one year's article from the Scanner. And mm -hmm. I had these all arranged in chronological order. And I mm -hmm. said, and I read each of those in chronological sequence to see what the chemistry was like, to mm -hmm. see what the board would do one night, maybe what the superintendent would do, what the community would say. Mm -hmm. And then my wife and I would sit and, and say, well, now we've read about what happened yesterday. What do you think is going to happen tomorrow? Hmm. And so she'll say, why don't you turn to the end to see what happened? I say, no, I want to see this unfold. So we continue to read, the, like a saga, oh. continue to read it. So when I came to interview for the job, I actually, in my own mind, had done a very thorough background research Mm -hmm. uh, on the school system, pretty well knew who the political players were, knew what the positions were. So what may have appeared to have been an interview that was directed toward a person not knowing a great deal about Portland was really being directed to me after I had done a great deal of study on the school system. But when I came here, Bruce, and was fortunately hired by the Board of Education, I inherited a school system which was a fine school system, no mm -hmm. question about it. Okay. By the same token, when I began to look at those things which I felt were very, very deficit, it was very, very clear to me what the deficit positions were. The first thing that was very, very deficit is that our Board of Education, which at that time uh, was having difficulty with many people in our community, it had in fact made a promise that it was going to locate uh, a, a school, a middle school in the black community, mm -hmm. and it had indicated where that building was going to be. And uh, one of the problems was is that for a variety of reasons, on the basis of further study, the board had decided not to locate the school there. As I looked at what the commitment of the board was, I recommended to them, I said, really in this instance, it doesn't matter which of the buildings costs more, it doesn't matter which of the buildings might be logistical, logistically superior to another. The fact is, we made a promise to the community. Mm -hmm. We must keep our promise, and on the basis of that, the board did accept my recommendation to place the Harriet Tubman Middle School at its current location. Mm -hmm. So I think that issue was dealt with reasonably well. 
We're also in the midst of a very, very hot issue. Uh, at the time, uh, the, uh, prior to my having come, a movement had come underway in the Jackson attendance area mm -hmm. where the Jackson High School had, thre had threatened to secede from the uh, Portland School District. I had been in education quite a while. I'd had all these experiences I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. That's the first time I had ever heard the word <laughs> secession mentioned since I studied the Civil War. Mm -hmm. And I'd never heard that concept. And so I had to do a lot of legal research and things of that kind. That issue finally worked itself out. And of course, Jackson's was closed. Mm -hmm. That student body was combined with the Wilson student body. Now there's Jackson Middle School there. But I cannot say that that particular situation at any time was handled to where there did not continue to exist some minimal feelings of consternation and animosity between mm -hmm. some people in the Jackson community and our Portland school system. But we did the best there that we could. The other issue that I found was that um, when I looked at the achievement of our black youngsters, our black youngsters in Portland at this time were reading at the 32nd percentile which was the lowest in the United States of any black kids. I have never said that, okay, but oh. now that I'm leaving, I'll say it. <laughs> okay, okay. They were reading in 1982, the lowest level of any uh, black kids in the nation from whom statistics had been gained and any place that you could make statistical comparison at about the 32nd percentile. They were performing in mathematics at about the 25th percentile. Hmm. It was very, very clear that we had a huge job ahead of us, even to bring our black youngsters to a national average or so. And I knew that was going to be a lot of work. But I also mm -hmm. knew that we were, that was, we were scarce of resources. The only resources that this district at that time uh, placed in so far as attempting to remediate the many, many years of, uh, of disadvantaged treatments and inequitable treatment that only blacks had received here, but throughout the country. The only thing that we had, we did have early childhood education centers. We had established a Jefferson's art magnet. We had placed integration specialists. And we did have a plan called an a desegregation plan. But in my mind, it was not an integration plan. I made that clear during the interview. I said, uh, to me, what we have in Portland is not an integration plan. It is a plan which I embrace, which I endorse, which I think is very, very wise, because it returns our black youngsters to the black community. Mm -hmm. It places them there and, does, and, and takes off their shoulders mm -hmm. the burden of one-way busing. Mm -hmm. I did not want one-way busing. Mm -hmm. By the same token, what I really wanted was a total integration plan. But Bruce, as I began to talk with our community mm -hmm. and ask them questions as to whether or not they, in fact, truly did want an integration program. Remember, I had come from Lansing, right. where all right. of our schools, all 65 schools in Lansing, mm -hmm. were, in fact, integrated. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I said they were not integrated, I'm sorry, all schools were desegregated, okay? okay? They were not integrated. Right. They were desegregated. Okay. And I said, do you really want a true desegregation plan? Between April 1st of 1982 and uh, May 18th of 1982, which was the date when the tax base election occurred, mm -hmm. I spoke to 137 audiences in Portland. I asked many of them do you want a true desegregation integration plan? I say, if so, it means that all schools must be integrated. To me, we don't have a desegregation plan or an integration plan when we say that if a school in the black community has more than 50% minority mm -hmm. kids, that that is a segregated school. Mm -hmm. I say that a school which has, uh, whether it has a majority of black youngsters that may be 55 or 60%, or is not nearly as segregated as a school which has 99% white kids. In fact, I would say that the school which has 99% white kids or kids only of the majority race are really more deficit in terms of understanding humanity, learning how to live in the world with other people. I think that mm -hmm. that school has more problems mm -hmm. than a school that may be over 50% mm -hmm. black, okay? And so, uh, but as I asked the audience, I said, do you really want these various audiences? I say, do you really want a plan that calls for the integration of all schools. I presented this question to ACLU, I presented this question to people of NAACP, to the Black United Front, uh, to members of all of our communities around this, uh, this, this, this area, and not once did I hear, yes, we want a desegregated school system. Hmm. Let's leave things as they are, Dr. Prophet. Let's not bother that. I said, fine. What we will do then is to attempt to educate kids where they are. 
The task as I then saw it was to make sure that we got our tax base. And now I'm getting to a point that will probably establish the kind of historic background against which we can relate and compare okay. where we are now to where we were then. Mm -hmm. In 1982, uh, this school district was living from hand to mouth. Each year, we'd have to go to the public and ask the public, please give us $25 million or so in addition to our tax base so we can operate next year. We would operate that year. Again, the board and superintendent and our staff and community would go back to the, to, to the electorate and ask, would you again give us 25 or $26 million this year mm -hmm. so we can operate next year? That had been happening for a long time, Bruce. In fact, from 1968 to 1982, there had not been a tax base passed in Portland. The people, however, did pass the tax base by a very, very narrow margin. Many, many, many people worked very, very hard. Mm -hmm. Our teachers went from door to door. As I mentioned, I gave 137 talks. I begged, I pleaded, I said, mm -hmm. please, if you give us the money, we will improve student achievement. We will do things that I think will make you proud of the Portland schools. We passed that very narrowly. Uh, we were fortunate by virtue of only 100,000 voters coming to the polls. The vote was 50,500 voters in favor of the tax base, which would be a permanent tax base. And the other uh, uh, persons voting against it were 49,500 because there was only a 1,000 vote difference. It placed it within the parameters of where votes are taken when there must legitimately be a recall, or I'm sorry, not a recall, a recount mm -hmm. of, the, of the vote. We prevailed and that was good. So for the first time, in some 14 years, Portland finally had a fiscal base where it could begin planning. Once this was established, I proposed to the Board of Education that we then begin to undertake the task of putting in place a comprehensive planning system for the school system. Because what they were doing before, and they were doing a good job of it, I'm not mm -hmm. being critical, they mm -hmm. were doing the best they could with what they had. But instead of going back every year, say, will you give me this this year? Will you give me this mm -hmm. this next year? We then had something we said would last for four years. So. When we received the 25 or 26 million extra dollars as a permanent uh, fixture on the tax base, we then said that we must use those dollars to improve student achievement. What did we do? We began, first of all, looking at what kinds of programs can we put in to remove many of the inequities that have existed. Uh, in addition to that, Bruce, we did have a physical plan in the district which was uh, in reasonably fair shape, but not excellent shape. And uh, as I would compare Portland's physical plant with other physical plants, it was not one that I was as proud of then as I am now. But those dollars have been used for that purpose. But even more importantly, we began looking at programs. What programs did we look at? We said there must be more programs to see, first of all, that young people come to school healthy. Mm -hmm. you see, there has, in fact, begun to uh, exist in this nation a set of real, uh, realistic conditions where young people, because of a lack of health care, because mm -hmm. of many changing patterns of family structure and many things in our society, I'm not here to be critical, mm -hmm. but the fact of the matter is drugs are destroying America. Mm -hmm. I, the, ma the matter of the fact is I think that the moral fiber and the moral principles upon mm -hmm. which this country functioned very, very well for a long time have begun to deteriorate. Mm -hmm. And I think that our family structure is absolutely miserable. Mm -hmm. And that goes for all races and all classes of people. Mm -hmm. That's not without respect to race, creed, mm -hmm. or color. It's happening. So we began to put a lot of money into health programs. We began to look at what kinds of daycare existed for young people. What kinds of health examination for looking at testing kids hearing in their eyes and their nose and their teeth and the, the vaccination uh, and, 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 and immunization programs. Mm -hmm. We then looked at other schools. For example, the original plan in Portland, which was dealing with our minority youngsters, focused primarily in northeast Portland, where we were talking about uh, Vernon and Woodlawn and mm -hmm. Humboldt and King School, but there were other schools in other parts of Portland as I looked around where the situation was just as bad. Mm -hmm. In other words, I could not tell the difference, Bruce, uh, if I were to go to Bald School in North Portland, mm -hmm. be with those youngsters there, or to go to Clarendon School in North Portland, or to go to Lent School in Southeast Portland, if I were mm -hmm. to really try to discern the difference of what mm -hmm. the needs of the kids were. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about what their parents may have done. I'm talking about the kids, because mm -hmm. I have very, very narrow vision when it comes to education. Mm -hmm. I always look at things in terms of what kids. impact does it have on kids. So we proposed programs, and the board approved those, those, those proposals I made to install programs at Beach School, for example, for early childhood education. 
also at Ball School, programs at Clarendon School and places of that kind. We also, Bruce, have installed at our middle school at risk specialist. We have put in SAT mentoring programs. We put in partnership programs. We put in Spanish immersion programs, Japanese immersion programs, math engineering science programs, math engineering or math science institutes at Grant. In fact, I have a listing. This doesn't. This program does is, does not lend itself to, to to my reading a list. But let me say mm -hmm. this to you: mm -hmm. that from 1982 uh, until 1991-92. I recommended and the board approved the installation of some 68 different programs dedicated to minority youth and poor youth. Those programs were not my creation. None of them was my creation. Those programs came into existence because of a community here in Portland who genuinely is interested in our kids. And I'm talking about all of our people. I'm talking about people in Portland who you would expect to be supportive of youngsters, but I'm also talking about people who have been critical of education, mm -hmm. who have been critics of the district. Mm -hmm. Even our severest critics, in my opinion, genuinely do have mm -hmm. an interest in our young people. So as they would come to me for suggestions from school A or school B or school C or school D and say, Matt, we've got an idea of something we may want to help our kids, such as a Saban demonstration project, mm -hmm. which has been a topic later on. Or if there was a program such as at Clarendon, there's a Timex program there that we've got, we always put those programs in. What have been the results of those initiatives? Well, the results have been, let's reflect back on what I said earlier about reading. Our youngsters are reading, our black youngsters are reading at the 32nd percentile. Hmm. They are now reading above the national average. They're at the 51st or, or 52nd percentile, which represents about a 65 or a 66 percent improvement in reading. There is another system in the United States where black youngsters have advanced that, that, that dramatically. By the same token, Though our advances have been more dramatic, remember what I also said is that in 1982, the black kids in this school system, as I compared them with the black youngsters and other school systems, were probably performing at the lowest point. Mm -hmm. Similar advances, Bruce, were made in mathematics, and mm -hmm. we have advanced from the 25th percentile for our black youngsters in mathematics, and now they're performing at about the 46th percentile. Mm -hmm. They are still below the national average. Now, mm -hmm. they are performing above the national average for other black youngsters, but mm -hmm. they are not at the national average mm -hmm. of all youngsters. Which and is, I think that which 50%, is 50%, the national okay. average is always 50%. Okay. What, has been, what have been some of the other results? Right here, if I could show it to you. Uh, I began keeping records in 1987 toward the objective of determining the extent of the number of our graduates who were going to go to college. And uh, what it showed then, Bruce, was that in 1987, of every 100 young students graduating in Portland, about 60 percent of them had plans to go to college. What that has translated to now is that there are 80 percent of them who have plans. Yeah. In addition to that, what you should know is that we actually did a follow-up study in 1989, the class of 89, when at which time 70 percent of our kids said they're mm -hmm. going to go to college. Mm -hmm. We did a follow-up study to determine that 65 percent of them actually did go. Hmm. Let me give you a surprising statistic, and this will be something that will probably blow the minds of our listeners, mm -hmm. our viewers, I should say. Uh, in 1987, 49.9% of all of the black youngsters graduating from Portland High School said they were going to go to college. Mm -hmm. In 1980, that percentage is now 79.9. Right now, the black kids in this, and we happen to believe that, that, in fact, we've looked at the class of 89, that there's only about a 5% variance. And so I'm saying to you that about 75%, three out of every four black youngsters graduating from the school system are going to college. Another surprising fact is that I, there's 79.9% of black youngsters who, who are on their way to college. That compares with 79.3% of white kids. Hmm. And black kids are exceeded only by Asians who are out of sight, mm -hmm. admittedly. Yes, they're about 91% yes. or so, mm -hmm. and they're truly educational models. What else has happened? We have had enormous increases in the SAT scores of all of our kids. Uh, we have had uh, gains not only of our black youngsters, every single ethnic group in terms of cognitive growth have advanced very highly significantly. That's on the positive side. By the same token, we have not done as well for the, uh, the American Indian youngster. I admit that for the American Indian youngster, that that has remained a perplexing dilemma to all of us. We've tried everything mm -hmm. to include all of the recommendations that have been brought forth. We still find a very highly unacceptable dropout rate. 
and though their, their achievement has progressed ever so slightly, it does not compare with the advances that have been made by black youngsters, Hispanic youngsters, Asian youngsters, and our white youngsters. So Bruce, in essence, uh, our district has had an unprecedented decade of growth. I've had the opportunity to serve last year as the president of all of the urban superintendents. That includes the 65 major urban school systems in this country. During our sessions when we meet, and we sit and uh, we meet twice a year, we talk about our school systems, we share our miseries, we mm -hmm. also share our glories and the mm -hmm. things of which we're proud. I can say to you that uh, Portland ranks either first, second, or third out of those 65 mm -hmm. school systems when it comes to true progress being made by our school system. Uh, and we're very, very proud of that. Now, getting to the current situation. Yes. I told you earlier about the tax base that okay. was um, passed by our public on May 18, 1982. Mm -hmm. I also told you that that particular tax base was to have lasted four years, which meant that the tax base was to have lasted 82, 83, 84 through the 85, 86 school year. Mm -hmm. It means that at that time, our school board may have chose to go back to the public and say, we've kept our promise. We now need more resources. But we had some very good developments to occur in the 80s. You may remember in the early 80s when we were getting into the initial years of Reaganomics, we'd come out of the Carter administration, mm -hmm. at which time inflation was double digit, 13, 14, 15 percent. Mm -hmm. When we went to the public in 1982 and asked for the support that we did get, we anticipated that the inflation rate through the early 80s, that year that we were talking about the tax base, that the inflation rate was still going, was going to stay at about 8, 9, or 10 percent. That did not occur. We've had inflation rates in the 3, 4, 5 percent area. Mm -hmm. The gap between the projected inflation rate and the actual inflation rate that developed created resources for us that permitted us the dollars to be able to put into programs. In addition to that, and this is a point also that I want to make, have our public here tonight, we began cutting administration the first year I was here. One other promise I made to our community was that when I become superintendent, I promise you that I will cut administration. Mm -hmm. I've done that. Uh, I have here a listing of the cuts that have been made for the last 10 years. And what our public should know is that I have cut from administration prior to any involvement of the Board of Education, so talking about this, this year's budget, some $45 million out of administration. What the public also needs to know is all these programs we're talking about, like Timex and the Sabin program, Financial Academy at Jefferson, adding to the Computer Science at Jefferson, the Technology program at Madison, the Math Science program at, uh, at Grant High School, the program that we've got over at uh, Lincoln International Baccalaureate, first one monitoring program at Roosevelt, SAT mentoring program, the MESA program that mm -hmm. Ms. Renee Anderson mm -hmm. uh, heads and so forth. Mm -hmm. Of the $45 million or so that was cut from administration, $30 million was taken. And I placed that money with the approval of the Board of Education in these kinds of programs. So I want people to get a perspective. Over the 10-year period, uh, we have placed $45 million or so in programs designed to help minority kids. Mm -hmm. Now I want you to compare that now with uh, what the current Furor is over. Mm -hmm. yeah, we're okay, sure. we're talking. We're talking over the course of ten years where we've put tens and tens of millions of dollars to help kids, which is where the money belongs. This year, admittedly, because of ballot measure five, I saw that it would be necessary to begin to take a little money back. Okay, and the places, the only places that we had, Bruce, from which dollars could be taken in a way that I felt would not damage program was somewhere in the Performing Arts Program, not the basic program at Jefferson, mm -hmm. but the Performing Arts Program at Jefferson. I also saw that there may be a necessity to try to support the Saban demonstration project, not through the general fund, but it was my intent to probably, hopefully, get some kind of corporate support for that because we've mm -hmm. had so many corporate people that are involved. Mm -hmm. In fact, there were none of the very minimal cuts which I had recommended to the Board of Education, which I felt could not be compensated for from the private sector. Now let's talk about ballot measure five because that's important. I've told you about the solid tax base that we've had, the solid fiscal operations. Our district has been fiscally organized and the management of the district I think has been superb by our financial officers, mm -hmm. by our principals and so forth to a point where I would have anticipated prior to ballot measure five the ability of our school system to survive through the year 2000. We could have continued to add, cut administration, add, cut administration, add, 
save dollars here, creatively use certificates of participation or bondings and so forth, but place more dollars with the youngsters. How, and then, however, along comes ballot measure five. five. I said it in 1990, in September and October. I know that I have been criticized by the media. I know that when I said in 1990 on the Sunday before people voted on that Tuesday for ballot measure five, I say you will rue the day that you vote for ballot measure five. This will mean cuts in education across the state, and many, many people will get pink slips. Well, what I was went laughed wrong? at. What went wrong? I was I laughed at. The, the people proposing ballot measure five says, don't worry, mm -hmm. everything's going to be okay. Right, exactly. Now the chickens are come home yep. to roost, yep. not only in Portland, across, across <laughs> the state. And isn't it ironic that one of the few people who had the guts to raise their voice and speak their minds, and I was one of those people, and I will do, did it then, I'll do it now. It was a mistake for this state to pass ballot measure five. It was irresponsible. I said that they had designed something which was admittedly needed to reduce property taxes. Property taxes were too high. Mm -hmm. Property taxes are regressive. But you don't take it away from the kids and not pass something else to replace it. What has happened is that you've taken away the property taxes, but there's nothing to replace it. So here's how the structure goes. Uh, it has, it was, the ballot measure five is a five-year process. Mm -hmm. And it's designed this way, Bruce. Uh, there are three biennia. In our, in, that are involved in this in terms of the legislature. The biennium 91 to 93, 93 to 95, and 1995 to 1997. The estimates were made by the Revenue Office and by the Department of Education and others in the legislature that the needs of the state during the first biennium, ballot measure five, would be $600 million to replace the dollars lost through ballot measure five. 1991-92 was the first year of ballot measure five. Our school system fortunately only lost about $10 million. I had already cut about $5 million or so before proposing to the Board of Education in 1991-92 a budget. Later on that summer, last summer, we found out that we had lost another $5,881,000. And our Board of Education was very, very wise in so far as saying we must cut those dollars, and they did. Mm -hmm. And we were able to cut those dollars at that time without impacting the delivery of things to the, to the classroom. Then, that's only year one, okay? We're talking year one of biennium one, 1991-92. Now I have proposed a budget to the board for the second year of the biennium of, of ballot measure five, 92-93, in which there was a proposal to reduce some $8 million. The board has reduced $8 million. It has chose to reduce it in a manner slightly different than my recommendation, but that doesn't, that, that's okay, because in our, in our budget, Bruce, what you should know, the public needs to know this, there are 50,000 line items in our budget. Our Board of Education changed about 40 line items. They did change those line items in a way which I think they were wise to do so, where more burden was placed upon continuing administrative cuts. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that, because they do have a commitment to our kids in the classroom, as do I. But I was attempting to make the cuts earlier on and then leave those things in place and then later on hoping that there would be some kind of recuperation mm -hmm. from the state. So the first biennium, Bruce, calls for $600 million. Mm -hmm. Now, when we get beyond 92, 93 and we go into biennium number two, the original estimates, estimates made by the Office of Revenue in Salem with regard to the need for the shortfall, to mm -hmm. replace the shortfall in Salem is one point two billion, I said with a B, one point two billion dollars that they'll need to replace. Where do they get the money? Well, there's no place to get the money except that they must get money from corrections or they must get money from social services or they must get money from higher education. It's been, mm -hmm. been said that uh, prior education, for example, to meet the cuts that could be their obligation uh, for the next biennium, it may well be that they will need hundred and fifty-five million dollar cuts. I've been told that they could close the four, they could close four of the eight institutions of higher education mm -hmm. in the state of Oregon, and the chancellor would still be short $55 million. This gives you some idea. So what's going to happen beyond this is the following. Uh, Portland, on the one hand, is fortunate by having a, uh, a, a, a set of properties within its boundaries that are very high valued. When I first came here, Bruce, the total assessed valuation of the properties in Portland was approximately $11 billion. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. That evaluation now has gone to about $14 billion. Mm -hmm. The way you, you, you uh, judge and or determine the wealth of a district is you take the value of taxable property and you divide the number of kids you have into that, that amount. When you divide our 57,000 youngsters into $14 billion, you come up with something in excess of $240,000 behind each kid. Mm -hmm. That's not bad. It's mm -hmm. not the best in the state, but it's pretty good. Mm -hmm. And so that's why our tax rates could be reasonably good and uh, not exorbitant, and we could have that kind of support. But now that you've gone to ballot measure five, it's immaterial what your wealth is, okay? It doesn't matter what your wealth is. Mm -hmm. uh, ballot Measure 5 has made it necessary for the state to bring in a, a, an approach to educational funding which they're terming equalization, which means that on the one hand where our, our Portland youngsters were getting monies that our taxpayers were paying because they could afford to pay it because of, our, because of the value of our properties, they won't be getting that any, any longer. Mm -hmm. uh, what we're getting now, we're determined, we've been determined to be a zero district. In other words, you get no more than you got last year. In fact, next year they're saying to us we could be getting $25 million less than we're getting this year. Mm -hmm. There are other districts in our state, however, that are plus 25% districts. So uh, the state does not have the ability to replace the property taxes uh, for biennium 9395. Now there's a third biennium, 9597. In 95, 97, and we knew this, you know, before people yeah. voted, as right. I was crying right. and praying and begging and so <laughs> forth, the shortfall then is going to be $2.2 billion for 95, 96, and 96, 97. And uh, as you look at the Portland schools, what you're looking at right now is only the tip of the iceberg. The $8 million cuts, which in all have been imp uh, uh, implemented this year, Okay. could very possibly translate next year, Bruce, into cuts ranging between $30 million and $40 million. But we're still determined not to let that happen. That's the bad news. The good news is that our Board of Education is doing an extraordinarily good job when it comes to analyzing what needs to be done. They're attempting mm -hmm. to mobilize the appropriate political entities to have those political entities come to the support of the Portland schools. They're attempting to develop certain new funding scenarios and educational mm -hmm. financial reform in a manner that will prove to be more advantageous to Portland. I have very great confidence in our new superintendent, Jack Beerworth, who is becoming, he's here in town right now. Mm -hmm. He's becoming very familiar with the fiscal realities, visiting with the governor and with the state superintendent, meeting the legislatures, visiting with the board, and I think he's going to do a good job as well. So on the one hand, the potential is there for those cuts to develop. On the other hand, it's possible that uh, the governor could come up with a solution. I've, I've, I've heard, for example, that it's possible she might call for a special session of the legislature. Let me stop there. You may want to ask me a few questions. No, or so, no, but the I, point I, as I indicated, I want to make is, is that uh, this is the beginning of what was projected, and we're going, we're doing our very, very best to preserve all the programs for all the kids. Mm -hmm. By the same token, when we get into cuts in the range of uh, 30, 40, 50 million, and then later on 60 million and so forth, that becomes pretty mm -hmm. difficult to do. And as people talk about administration, they should remember one thing. My central administration in this district cost six million dollars, all right? If you eliminated everyone, if you eliminated the superintendent, if you eliminated the person who brings food to the, to the buildings, that's an administrator too. Remember, mm -hmm. when people talk about administration, it's kind of a global generic perception that this is a worthless kind of person, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. But remember what administrators do. We have administrators who, who, who are in charge of buses, who, 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 who transport kids who cannot hear, who cannot see, who cannot talk, who have brain damage. We have administrators who take food to the schools. We have administrators who, uh, who, who are in charge of our police to make sure our kids are safe. You know, those are all the people mm -hmm. that we're calling administration. So mm -hmm. we have administrators who buy books for kids and administrators who plan their curriculum and that kind of thing. So everyone has, you know, I don't care what one does, it requires some kind of administrative support behind mm -hmm. it. We've tried to make that lean and mean when I first came to Portland, uh, we had six layers of administration between the classroom teacher and the superintendent. We had a classroom teacher, then we had a principal, we had an area administrator, had an area superintendent, we had an assistant superintendent, then we had a deputy superintendent, then we had a superintendent. Mm -hmm. I eliminated all those layers of intervening bureaucracy so that now you go from the classroom teacher to the principal to director of instruction right to my office. So I've eliminated three intervening layers. So we are a very lean school system. And as I've mentioned, the list story here for anyone to check, 
we have cut in excess of $45 million from administration. With the cuts the board implemented mm -hmm. the other night, mm -hmm. that makes about $50 million. But even if you go back and get all the central administration, uh, so you cut six more million, the answer is where does the other 30 million come from? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's one good way of kind of looking mm -hmm. at it. Once you get rid of all of that, Matt, where else you get Matt, the dollars from? And, and we're getting at that point. I would like to ask you a couple of questions. Um, <clears throat> one, what do you say to the to the new superintendent, the new uh, to to Beerworth? What do you say to him at this I point? I say to him that Jack, you have got a community that supports education. Okay. That these people will. Uh, they are very demanding. They love their kids. They're interested in their kids. They're going to monitor what you do. They're going to make you accountable. But they may be critical. What's different about the Portlanders is that they will criticize you, but if you ask them to help you, they will roll up their sleeves and they will help. It's a unique community. Mm -hmm. By the same token, I'll say to him that, Jack, you're going to have difficulty to get the word out as to what the realities are. Uh, you'll have people to come in and to observe something for two or three minutes. And, and the media will come in and they'll make a snap judgment that you got a headline before they've heard the whole mm -hmm. story, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not saying that the media certainly has a capacity to do it, but there's something about the, the modern way of transmitting messages to our people. There's something about the, what, what I think is almost an inexplicable proclivity toward wanting to capitalize upon tabloidism and sensationalism to a point mm -hmm. where people don't really have the time to go into depth, you know? Mm -hmm. If your explanation, this is the first mm -hmm. time I've ever really had it this, mm -hmm. I've been here 10 years, okay? Mm -hmm. This is the first chance I've ever had the opportunity to make a statement that would not be a six second sound clip, mm -hmm. which may be in context, mm -hmm. may not be in context, it mm -hmm. depends on what view the media wants to present and so forth. Mm -hmm. And if Jack Beerworth, I think, can improve upon that, okay? okay? If I've had a fault, it's been that I have been an ardent and, you know, and, and, and a very indomitable spokesperson for education. When I thought that the, the future of kids' lives was at stake, whether we're talking about condoms, whether we're talking about health clinics, whether we're talking about sexual minority kids, whoever they are, I said I would be superintendent of all the kids for all times. Mm -hmm. And I mean that, whether the kid is white, black, a Russian immigrant, I don't care. Mm -hmm. He or she's a kid, okay? And because I have been outspoken, I have, I, I think that, uh, and, and, some, and by the same token, the media's treated me very, very well. Yeah, sure. Okay, I'm not, I'm, it's not all been one-sided. So I'll say to him that, uh, that he's got a very helpful community. But he has to be very, very uh, uh, innovative and uh, take maybe a little different tack when it comes to getting the word out. He has to be more successful okay. than I have concentrated on being in the schools. Like I've enrolled in schools, uh, Bruce, I remember that. as a yes. student, you know. Yes. I know our schools because I have been a student in our schools mm -hmm. with our kids. It's not mm -hmm. on theory. Mm -hmm. I've been there as a student, okay? I think another thing that uh, I would say to Jack is that uh, he has his challenge of attempting to preserve these programs, okay? This time we've only talked about two or three programs. There are 68 such programs. Mm -hmm, I didn't mm -hmm. say anything about the other 65. Mm -hmm. All the turmoil and the furor have centered around three programs, which is a grain of sand on a beach of improvement that we've mm -hmm. made. You have seen nothing yet. If you could look through the kinds of things we've got that are serving thousands of kids, we've tried to make this system one that's good for the special ed kid, for the autistic kid, for the gifted kid, mm -hmm. whoever, for the Russian kid, for the Spanish youngster, mm -hmm. for the Asian youngster, for the Latin American kid, doesn't matter who they are. Uh, and we've tried to make our system that way and it is very, very comprehensive. Okay. And so what I like about our people is that they've seen that these programs are working and when they first heard we were gonna cut those programs, they descended on us and say, don't you dare do it. Yeah. These programs, yeah. and that's great, you know. It's bad, but it's good, mm -hmm. okay? And so uh, somehow, some way, he's got to uh, okay. know how to survive that. What do you say to the school board? Continue to keep their uh, deep dedication to our youth. Their values are in the right place. They don't want to see anything happen bad to our kids. And I hope that they continue to work with Jack Beerworth in the same kind of supportive atmosphere as they have with me over, over the 10 years. There's never been differences between myself and the school board in our 10 years. That's unusual in America. You know, the yes, tenure of the American urban superintendent is 27 months. <laughs> uh, Connie imagine. Clayton from I Philadelphia and, and I here in Portland are the senior superintendents in the United States. <laughs> I've been here 10 years or so. Wow. But we've got a good school board okay. and they are, uh, I think they and Jack will make a darn good team. What about the parents? What do you say to the parents? Continue about their to, kids? to push the way they are. I would say to them that they need to be a little bit more active, though, okay? 
I have good things to say about parents. On the other hand, I think that sometimes our parents are a little bit lackadaisical. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I, I go to all of the, the, never does two year never do two years pass, Bruce, that I don't go to a school. You know, we've got 112 different locations here. I make it my point somehow, some way. If it's just a matter of waving in the door, saying hello, how you doing today, to get around to all schools within every two years or so. And so, what I find in some of our schools is that. Sometimes our parents never show unless there are problems. The parents love their kids. They send us the best kids they've got. They all love their kids, 99.9% .9 of them. But sometimes they don't get as actively involved in the education of their kids as they should. And sometimes you only see them when there's a problem. I like to see the same kind of turnout when we're doing positive things. I would also ask the parents to try to emphasize with their youngsters and with others in the community the positive things that are happening. I'm fearful that uh, too many of us focus only on the negatives. I'll give you one example, and I'll be quiet for a while. Okay. About a year or so ago, um, we invite a, a young man up from Florida A&M University who happens to be the head of the business school there, and he was recruiting. He was trying to recruit black youngsters to go to Florida A&M. And so we invited him to come. And we invited the media to come. We had on the 41st floor of U.S. Bancor an invitation extended to young black uh, students who had high SAT scores and high grades so that they could be going to these, uh, these um, programs at Florida A&M University. We invited all media. We invited radio, television, uh, and, and, and all, and the newspapers, I should say. There were 38 black youngsters there with their parents, uh, very, very anxious to receive scholarships and, uh, and, and awards and so mm -hmm. forth for an A&M. We looked around, hoping that out of that we were going to get some real positive coverage of these outstanding young black students. You know how many media persons showed? Zero. Hmm. By the same token, we could put a rumor out that there's someone who is going to demonstrate you know, someplace against whatever. It doesn't matter what it is. Yeah. I'll guarantee you that you will make sure the media will be there. Mm -hmm. In our board meetings, Bruce, you mm -hmm. can come to a board meeting. We can bring in young people. We do it every year. Hundreds and hundreds of our young people who are receiving awards for outstanding achievements. And the media may also, on that same agenda for the board, there may be something which has the hint of being controversial. I can see many of our media people who come, Bruce, and when these young people are being rewarded and given awards and we're extolling their virtues, there's no interest in it. Mm -hmm. On the same token, as soon as the controversy starts on this issue, it doesn't matter what it is, the lights begin to flash and so forth. Bruce, there's something wrong with the mentality in America, something deadly wrong. And I think that negativism feeds up on negativism. We've got to be accountable. We know we're not perfect. We know we can improve, but let's do more to give our youngsters positive encouragement. That's very important. Okay. I would ask Jack Beerworth to see what he can do with our community okay. to really emphasize the positive. I got a couple more points I want to ask sure. you. What do you say to your teachers that you've been with for years and, and your staff? Yes. What do you say to them? I, they've been great. Uh, I've got a staff of people whom I admittedly, admittedly have protected. I have admittedly attempted to shield them from the slings and arrows of those who are saying that education is in need of reform. And I'm not saying it isn't, but what people don't know is that uh, as I go out and I look at teachers in buildings where people say that teachers aren't doing their job, what I see teachers do, that's an example, when I was a student, at Bald, a student at Bald School, I see teachers who come to Bald School one hour before school starts. When I go to Applegate School, you can go there any day, you'll see teachers there two hours after, after school's over. I can go to Tubman School, you'll see teachers going far and beyond the call of duty. I say to our teachers that they're great, 99 point percent of them great. are great people, great. and I'm proud of them. Great. And then lastly, how about your students, the kids? They're some who've graduated. That is the in. time when, when June comes, and late May and June comes every year, and you go and you see young kids. In fact, I had a, I had a girl interview me the other day from Jefferson High School who says, I was second grade or something. I think she's 11. <laughs> I remember you. You came to my school. And then, and then later on, you see these kids walk across the stage at the Civic Auditorium and making their great achievements and so forth. They make it very, very proud. Okay. Our students are very responsible. They're good. They know much, much more than people think they do. 
Uh, you know, I, I tell you one, this is one last thing. When people are critical of our kids and talk about what they're learning, and I had this experience with uh, a group of citizens in Lansing when they said uh, our kids aren't learning as much as we did. I said, I'd like to show you the test that these kids have to take for their high school diploma. Would you be interested in taking this test, you know? And then there's quietness and so forth that begins to prevail. Our kids know more than you think they do. I think that they've grown tremendously when it comes to appreciating other people, when it comes to having respect for people of all races and all cultures and all intellects and all ethnicities. That's a kind of affective growth you don't hear a great deal about. Okay. And so our kids are great. Great. Matt, got about three more minutes. Sure thing. Where's Matt going to go? You mean our me? time has gone? Yeah, time is gone. Time is gone. You've been talking too much, Bruce. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> hey, it's always a pleasure okay. interviewing Matt. What am I going to do, Bruce? What I'm, are you going to do? I'm going to spend 25% of my time finishing the development of what I think will be a first in the United States, that is a scholarship assistance program for every single student graduating from the Portland schools. I want to be able to say it's the class of 1994 when they walk across that stage at Civic Center that your, your former superintendent has been working with hundreds of people in this state and across this country and through their efforts along with his it's now possible that you will have assistance whether you're going to go to college, community college, whether you want to go to a business school, whether you want to train to get a job, some way, somehow, you're going to have help. And that's what I'm going to work on. I'm going to spend a lot of time this summer in D.C. working with the Department of Education. I'm going to work with other departments such as agriculture, transportation, the interior, commerce, uh, the National Endowment of the Arts, National Science Foundation. I have a, gr a group in, in uh, D.C., the Institute of Education Leadership, doing a study on foundations to see how many foundations are going to support us. The Higher Education Scholarship Commission uh, here in Oregon has volunteered to help me. The Rotarians are going to help me. We have our counselors who are helping. I'm going to become the uh, co-chairman and the honorary chairman of the I Have a Dream Foundation. There are other programs we put in King School. I'm going to be working with the Rotarians for the Whitaker School and the West Sylvan School. We're going to get all 17 middle schools. We're going to have hundreds and thousands of people mentoring kids, build one heck of a super duper kind of assistance of mentoring for our youngsters. Jack Beerworth is in favor of it. I say, Jack, I want to work for you and help you and use me, use me, use me. Great, great. That's you know, what Matt, I'm I was going to ask you, uh, so I take it you're going to stick around? Going to stick around. You're going to be in Portland. Going to be in Portland. And, and I know that that supporter that you've not mentioned as long as you, as I've known, well, you've always have, I could, I could tell, and that's the wife. Oh, are you Wait, kidding, you boy? She her? is the backbone of our family. <laughs> Without her, you know, when I got, uh, when I, when I finished college, finally, I didn't want to go to school anymore. She says, you're going to quit now? I say, yeah. She says, you got to be kidding. Go get your master's. I did. I got my master's degree, and she said, uh, you can't quit now, can you? Why don't you get your... She has been the person Great. Of behind our family, behind me. And incidentally, she is the, in, she's the national director of International Training Services. I know your time's running out. Okay. My wife is working on the installation of wells in uh, Ivory Coast, Zaire, We're gonna this have kind you back of thing, on. back in Africa. Good. She's doing Great. a lot of work. Great. And, uh, Matt, thanks very much. More work than I'm doing. We're going to have an, we're gonna get thanks. you on another show, okay? Thanks, thanks. again. Thanks All right. much. It's a pleasure. Same Thank here. You, Matt. Okay. We'll be back on 30 and 38. We'll be right back. Have a good evening. As a Paragon Cable customer, you're connected to one of the most advanced networks of cable technology and service in the nation. At the source of your cable service is Paragon's Head End, the beginning of a system of more than 1,600 miles of cable, the distance from Portland to El Paso, Texas. Here, sophisticated two-way status monitoring measures picture quality throughout the system. Preventative maintenance technicians use this information daily to anticipate potential failures and identify adjustments needed to keep your reception clear. And if an outage occurs, status monitoring immediately alerts us to the nature and location of the problem. All of this occurs within seconds of an outage, anytime, day or night. Service technology, one more way Paragon is working harder to make cable better for you.
Most people think of me as being a very wise man, but the one thing I know that many people aren't aware of is that the expert medical care at all 22 Shriners hospitals is provided absolutely without cost. The Shriners help children up to age 18 regardless of race, religion, or nationality. How do I know? When I was a kid, I was a patient at a Shriners hospital. For more information, call this toll-free number. I'm Pat Morita. Thank you. We're on. I'm Bruce Broussard. Uh, we're on, uh, folks. We are we on now? I guess we are on. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host for Northeast Spectrum. Welcome to our second hour. Uh, we have been talking about Portland Public Schools. And uh, we just recently had the opportunity to chat uh, at length, for that matter, with uh, Dr. Prophet. This will probably be his last interview as su superintendent of Portland Public Schools. Again, we, uh, uh, we, wanted, we, wanted, we would like for you to have asked him questions, but hopefully you will call in at this point in time. We've got, we've got citizen participation now at this point in time, and we've got a board member from the Portland Public Schools and, and also a, a parent who is the chairperson of, uh, of the Jefferson Cluster. And we'll go into just what those, uh, those definitions are. And we've got, a, we've got another person, just a, just a citizen, if you will, uh, in, uh, in, a, 